Okay. All right. Da, 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 da. Thank you, Catherine and Jobdi. Yeah, if y'all would network with each other, please. Please network with each other because, like I said, I'm supposedly can see it and, and uh, what y'all see, and it's not happening that way. All right, listen carefully. Uh, chap uh, chapters 12 through 15 are, um, are going to fall into the areas of everywhere from cell division to genetics. Now, chapters 13, 14, and 50 are, 15 are definitely tied together. Okay, it has to do with uh, chapter 13 has to do with cell division that occurs in the testes of males and ovaries and females and how the type of cells that are produced are called gametes or sex cells that pass on genetic information to offspring. So 14 and 15 have to do with inheritance or patterns of inheritance. However, chapter 12 also has to do with cell division. Listen carefully. Under lecture, I have posted a Word document titled Chapter 12 through 15 Terms. I have posted a PowerPoint to go with it, Chapter 12 through 15 Terms. It's y'all's responsibility to go over those, but it goes over terms that you're going to see here from chapters 12 through 15. It'll be up to y'all to go over those terms, and hopefully that'll help clear things up that we're going to talk about here uh, in chapter 12. Okay, so make sure you look at those terms. Look at the PowerPoint with those terms. Yes, they're all testable because the terms I'm giving you we're going to talk about in chapters 12 through 15. Okay, but hopefully providing you a little additional information will strengthen your background. Okay, so chapter 12 and 13 have to do with cell division, but because cell division consists of a cycle of molecular events, you often hear it referred to as a cell cycle. So I'll go back and forth between the two. Okay. Cell division. For this chapter, we're going to focus on cell, a type of cell division that's tied into growth and development as well as what we call tissue renewal or regeneration, so as when you, such as when you get a cut. Chapter 13 will focus on a type of cell division that has to do with reproduction. Now, I'm going to be focusing mainly on us humans, but I will mention unicellular organisms briefly in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Both types of cell division okay, are tightly regulated. I'll talk about a protein often known as a tumor suppressor protein called P53, okay, but also there are other proteins involved in regulation in, in the sense of they make sure that cell division happens in the correct order. In other words, that certain steps are followed sequentially in order and that there's no disruption in that step so we don't end up with mutant cells such as cells that are cancerous. Therefore, there's order to this, and we'll talk about it. It's in your notes. Okay, we're going to go over a type of cell division in this chapter that I refer to as a cell cycle plus a mitotic phase. It's more popularly known as just mitosis. However, mitosis is a nuclear division. Okay, but it is eukaryotic cell division that we're focusing on here. <clears throat> so the textbook decides to get cute. This type of cell division involving mitosis, okay, it does play a role in reproduction, but that's for unicellular eukaryotic organisms, such as the protist amoeba. Okay, I don't, what I'm going to do is focus on us. Okay, so I'm explaining what the textbook was doing, and I wish they hadn't done this. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about a type of cell division that involves mitosis, and the purpose of that form of cell division in human beings is growth and development and tissue renewal. So go by what I gave you in the notes, everybody. For reproduction, I'll mention this in regards to prokaryotes a little bit more, but we're going to save uh, the second type of cell division for reproduction in regards to us animals or humans. <clears throat> Whenever cell division occurs, it doesn't matter if it's a type we're talking about in this chapter, which is a cell cycle involving the mitotic phase, or chapter 13, cell cycle involving the meiotic phase. Okay, Whenever one cell is going to divide into two, before the cell itself physically starts to divide from one into two cells, the DNA contained in the nucleus of these eukaryotic cells has to be replicated. Definition of replication, making an identical copy of a pre-existing molecule of DNA. Okay. Listen carefully. For eukaryotic DNA, eukaryotic DNA is described as linear DNA. So this is what they're showing you, a double-stranded helix of DNA, but it's linear. Prokaryotic DNA is circular in nature, so that's a big difference in terms of overall appearance. However, DNA is DNA as far as the overall makeup goes. Now, what will happen is we'll talk about when cell division is going to occur. We're going to talk about how there's a point before the cell physically separates from one into two where DNA replication has to occur. So molecules of DNA will each be replicated or copied to where we have identical copies, an original molecule and its copy. But we're going to talk about how technically these two linear molecules of DNA are still attached to each other. 
So they look almost like this. This is an actual molecule that's representing this over here. Oh, God, I forget the hand. So here you go again. Let me do it again. Sorry about the little hand. So we have a single molecule of double-stranded DNA. Okay, when DNA replication occurs, an identical copy of this molecule of DNA will be made to where we're now we have two molecules of DNA. But this is an actual picture of one of those replicated molecules. You can see it looks more like an X. So we'll talk about what we call DNA when it's in this shape and why it looks like a little X in a little while. Okay, briefly, as I said, eukaryotic cells such as amoeba, they do divide by this type of cell division we're going to talk about uh, in this chapter. But uh, I'm going to leave that aside and focus on us humans. However, briefly for prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, okay, they divide through a process. It's a type of cell division called binary fission. So if you ever hear binary fission, automatically tell yourself this is prokaryotic cell division. It's how prokaryotes reproduce, except prokaryotes, remember, don't have membranous organelles. They don't have a nucleus. So we never talk about mitosis and meiosis in reference to prokaryotic cells, okay? Mitosis and meiosis, as we'll talk about in chapter 12 and 13 respectively, are two different forms of nuclear division. Prokaryotic cells have no nucleus, so they call their type of cell division binary fission. However, what prokaryotic cell division has in common with eukaryotic cell division is DNA replication occurs. Now, where it says origin here, okay, they mean DNA. We'll talk about this later when we go over a chapter on DNA replication, but for now, wherever you see origin, they're referring to DNA. In prokaryotic cells, they have circular DNA, but it's all twisted up kind of like a, a large rubber band when you just kind of let it flop into place. It's not circular anymore. It's all folded up on itself, but it is circular. And what will happen is when a prokaryotic cell goes through binary fission, its circular DNA has to be replicated to where we have two copies. And while that DNA replication is occurring, the prokaryotic cell itself begins to elongate. It begins to stretch out. And those two copies okay, of circular DNA are separated from each other, all right? So here where it says origin, imagine they're talking two separate molecules of cir circular DNA. The two separate molecules, okay, are circulate, or how do you say, separated to opposite ends as the cell's outer barrier begins to pinch inward. So again, DNA replication occurs. We go from one circular piece of DNA to two. The prokaryotic cell begins to elongate. At the same time, the two circular molecules of DNA are separated, and the outer barrier begins to pinch inward. Okay, I say outer barrier because for prokaryotic cells, they don't just have a cell or plasma membrane. That plasma membrane has wrapped around it a cell wall and then possibly a capsule. We talked about this in Chapter 6, so make sure you put C Chapter 6 for review because you are going to need some of that information. Now, as this outer barrier pinches inward, eventually the opposite ends of this outer barrier come together, separating that one cell into two daughter cells. Now, the initial cell that entered binary fission, that initial prokaryotic cell, it is called a parent cell. The two cells it divides into are not only daughter cells, but they're referred to as identical daughter cells, not just because of appearance, but because they have exact copies of the same DNA. Therefore, they're both carrying the same genetic information between each other but also between the parent cell they came from, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into the type of cell division that I refer to as the cell cycle plus the mitotic phase or mitosis, okay? Now, if you look here, you're going to see some terms. The star of the show for most of this, a lot of it is DNA, okay? Double-stranded molecular DNA. Come on, switch. Okay, sorry, y'all. It's not responding. Um, I'm having trouble with my internet service, so it's very possible we run into a lot of issues. I'm sorry about that. I may have to re-record it, but real quick here. When it comes to eukaryotic DNA, there are three terms that are used when you talk about cell division. Chromatin, chromosome, sister chromatids. These are all terms listed in Chapter 12 through 15 terms. Okay, All three terms refer to eukaryotic DNA. When you hear the term chromatin, we're talking about DNA that is loosely packed or loosely coiled within the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. This is indicative of cells that are not dividing. The DNA remains very loosely packed, very diffuse, as we call it, takes up most of the nucleus. However, whenever a eukaryotic cell is going to divide, that DNA will tightly pack. 
It'll tightly pack or be found tightly packed in the chromosomes or more frequently what you'll see during cell division is sister chromatids. Okay. You don't hear much about sister chromatids. <clears throat> okay. Until you start taking your college courses, you should. Down here below, I have sister chromatid, what it is. It's an original chromosome attached to an identical copy of itself. They are attached at what we call their centromeres. Okay, now I posted a video. Make sure you're watching the video links that I posted, please. But in the video, they do about the best job I know of to explain, okay, why you'll hear chromosome and sister chromatid when they're actually talking about sister chromatid. The way it works is a sister chromatid itself, you can see here, this is an actual electron micrograph of a sister chromatid. Here's one chromosome, and it's attached to an identical copy of itself over here. Right here in red, I have listed centromere, okay? The centromere is an area where you have a high concentration of proteins that you're going to come to know as the kinetochore, okay? And the centromeres between these two chromosomes, okay, the identical copies of each other, will attach to each other, okay? So technically, we refer to this structure when they're attached to each other as sister chromatids, okay? Each one is an individual chromatid. However, down here, I put down karyotype, okay? On karyotypes, karyotypes are chromosome maps, and they're actually chromosome maps using sister chromatids. But to simplify the explanation of what a karyotype is and what it, the information it tells you, in the video, it tells you this also. Since these two copies are still attached at their centromere, for a karyotype, we cheat, and we just refer to them as chromosomes. A karyotype is a chromosome map. Okay. What I'm showing you here is a karyotype from female cells, human female cells, and a karyotype from human male cells. What they're showing you here are karyotypes of what we call diploid cells. I'm trying to type this in. I also have this in your terms. Okay, <clears throat> diploid cells. The abbreviation for diploid cells is 2N. Okay, the 2N is in reference to what you find in the nucleus of diploid cells of humans. All right, the 2 refers to the number of sets of chromosomes you find in most human cells that make up your body. Okay, these two sets of two sets of chromosomes, one set comes from your mom and one set of chromosomes comes from your dad. The N represents how many chromosomes are in that set, okay? So what geneticists found out is that in most of the cells of our body, first of all, they're called somatic cells. And all somatic cells that make up the majority of your body are diploid, so they're somatic diploid cells. But these somatic diploid cells, okay, have two sets of 23 chromosomes. One set came from your mom, and one set of 23 chromosomes came from your dad for a total of two sets of 23. Well, what else geneticists found out is that when a cell's dividing, if they catch the cell at a certain stage, it's easy to extract what they refer to as chromosomes, even though technically they're sister chromatids, they refer to them as chromosomes for simplicity. And what they found is even though diploid cells of our body, somatic diploid cells have a total of 46 chromosomes, okay, they can actually be paired up based on homology. For male and female cells, <clears throat> when a karyotype is created using their somatic diploid cells, okay, the 46 chromosomes can be paired together into 23 pairs. At a minimum for both female and males, the first 22 pairs are what we call homologous chromosomes, which I'm, uh, let me put the little finger, which are down here, okay? What else they found is that of those what they call first 22 pairs, which they call autosomes, what they found is they're not all the same in terms of height. So what they do on a karyotype is they'll take the first homologous pair, which is the longest or the largest, that look the most identical structurally, including the centromere being at the same location, and they'll put them together on a karyotype and refer to them as chromosome pair number one. And then from there, they'll go in descending order as far as size goes. The chromosomes get smaller and smaller, but they keep numbering them. So we have chromosome pair one, 
chromosome pair 2, chromosome pair 3, all the way down to chromosome pair 22. These first 22 pairs of chromosomes are called autosomes, which I gave you in those terms uh, notes that I posted. The 23rd pair of chromosomes in both females and males, those are referred to as the sex chromosomes. Now, for a female karyotype, the sex chromosomes are the same. It's a pair of X chromosomes. Therefore, down here in the box, I put down, females actually have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. The first 22 are called autosomes, and the last homologous pair are the sex chromosomes, a pair of Xs. However, for males, if you look down here in the box, males have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but only the first 22. They're autosomes, and they're homologous, but they're the only ones that are homologous. For males, the 23rd pair of chromosomes, those sex chromosomes, they're not homologous. One is a large X and the other one is a small Y. We'll visit this more in chapter 15, okay, as far as uh, what the Y chromosome contains. However, these are both karyotypes of what we call somatic diploid cells, okay? So cell division. Both chapters 12 and 13 focus on cell division, which is also known as the cell cycle. Both types of cell division begin with the first of two major phases called interphase. Okay. Interphase is one of two major phases of cell division of the cell cycle, and it's divided up into three smaller phases that take up roughly 90% of the time that a cell is dividing from one to two. Okay. The three subphases are known as G1, this should say S phase, I forgot to put it in, I'll show you another figure, and G2. Now here they say the G stands for growth. In my day, the G stood for gap because they weren't sure what happened, okay? Now when a cell is gonna divide, it'll always go through interphase first, whether it's chap uh, the type of cell division we talk in chapter 12 or chapter 13, the cell will always go through interphase first. And what I want you to know is when the cell is going through G1 phase, it's simply to enter S phase, where DNA synthesis occurs. Okay? They call it DNA synthesis. Uh, that's why they called the phase S phase. But in actuality, as geneticists and molecular biologists became more and more familiar with what happens during S phase, it's more commonly known as DNA replication. We will visit this again in Chapter 16, DNA replication, which happens during S phase. Once DNA replication is completed, <clears throat> the cell will enter G2 phase. During G2 phase, the cell is preparing to enter cell division. In other words, the cell is preparing to physically divide from one cell to, as they show you here, two cells, each with its own nucleus. Well, the type of cell division we're visiting in chapter 12, that's what this slide is for. If you notice this diagram, it's almost the same as the one I showed you before. Here's interphase. Here's G1, here's G2, but now above DNA synthesis, it gives you S phase. Then notice something else down here. Instead of saying cell division, it's telling you it's not any cell division. It's a type of cell division that involves a second major phase that happens after interphase. It's called the mitotic phase, okay? This type of cell division that involves a cell cycle plus the mitotic phase, if you look up at the top of the PowerPoint, only somatic cells, only somatic diploid cells go through this type of cell division for growth and development and for tissue renewal. In other words, healing of a wound or something like that, a replacement of skin cells. Okay. Now, this type of cell division will begin with the somatic diploid parent cell that will divide into two identical daughter diploid cells for the sole purpose of increasing the number of cells for growth and development or replacing any cells that were lost due to damage, okay? Now, as I said before, when a cell, G0 is not shown here. G0, if they were to show it, Javdi, about roughly before you get into G1, they would show you a little arrow exiting, exiting out of this cycle indicating that the cell is at rest. They used to call it senescence or cell senescence, okay? So if a cell's in G0, we just say it's moved out of cell division, it's no longer gonna divide. Does that help answer your question? Okay. All right, now, 
I said when a cell is in whenever a cell is going to divide, it'll always go through interface. So now we're going to focus on this first type of cell division, cell cycle plus the mitotic phase. Now, when a cell is going to divide through this process, it's still going to enter interface first. It'll enter G1 phase, get ready to enter S phase. When the cell enters S phase, well, what happens during S phase? DNA replication. The DNA you can think of as being tightly packed into chromosomes, therefore, it'll be duplicated. The DNA will be duplicated. The way I want you to think of it is this way over here to the right in this box. During S phase, DNA replication occurs. And what do I mean by that? The cell enters S phase with 23 pairs of chromosomes. All 23 pairs of chromosomes are replicated. What do I mean? Identical copies are made. The cell will then exit in phase, S phase. When the replication is complete, the cell will exit S phase, no longer with 23 pairs of chromosomes, but now with 23 pairs of sister chromatids. Remember, the purpose of this type of cell division is to go, to go from a somatic parent diploid cell to two identical daughter diploid cells. And in order for them to be identical to each other and to the parent they came from, they all have to have the same DNA. So if the parent cell had 23 pairs of chromosomes, both daughter cells need to have the same identical 23 pairs of chromosomes. The genetic information has to be the same. So what the cell's doing in S phase is basically, hey, I'm all these 23 pairs of chromosomes I have, I'm gonna make copies of all of them. So I have 23 pairs to give to this daughter cell and 23 pairs to give to another daughter cell, okay? Now, as I said, there's videos too that I gave you. Please watch those videos. I believe one of them I gave might have been the Amoeba Sisters. Uh, a lot of the professors say that's a good one to watch. Okay, so now, once S phase is completed, the cell will now enter G2 phase as it shows you up here. And what's happening during G2 phase? The cell is preparing to enter mitosis of the mitotic phase, okay? Now mitosis specifically is nuclear division. In other words, one nucleus dividing into two nuclei and both nuclei have to have 23 pairs of chromosomes like that original nucleus. Cytokinesis is not nuclear division. It's cytoplasmic division. It's the division of the cytoplasm by the cell membrane pinching inward, resulting in two separate cells, and hopefully each will have identical nuclei, okay? Now, before we get into this mitotic phase, which is made up of nuclear division called mitosis and cytoplasmic division called cytokinesis, briefly, I wanna talk about some regulatory elements and growth promoting factors, okay? The way it works for cell division is proteins. There are actually proteins that control the timing of the cell cycle. In other words, there are proteins ensuring that G1 happens first, followed by S phase, followed by G2. There are proteins that ensure, hey, look, when the mitotic, when the G2 phase is over and, and the cell moves into the mitotic phase, there are proteins that ensure mitosis happens before cytokinesis. Okay? These proteins are known as cyclin CDKs. They're sometimes referred to as growth factors. There are different types of cyclin CDKs. I just want you to know I'm a cyclin CDKs. The function of cyclin CDKs is to make sure that the cell divides in an orderly manner. Okay, so again, the function of cyclin CDKs is to make sure that this, a cell divides in an orderly manner. Hey, interphase starting with G1 to S phase to G2 then into the mitotic phase, beginning with mitosis, and then eventually ending with cytokinesis. That's the purpose of these guys. They have a lot of work to do. So it's very possible for mistakes to happen, especially during S phase. That is a lot of DNA that needs to be replicated. So there are also cell cycle checkpoints, okay? In other words, regulation. When those cyclin CDKs are doing their job, there are other proteins. Often they're referred to as tumor suppressor proteins. The most popular is known as P53. P53 is often referred to as a tumor suppressor protein, but actually what its job is, is to check for any errors that occur during cell division. And if it detects any errors that have occurred during cell division, it will cause the dividing cell to go in what, into what we call cell cycle arrest, stop dividing. 
Okay, say a mistake happens during S phase DNA replication. Let's say one of the DNA that makes up one of the chromosomes, there's a mistake when a copy is being made of it. It's not an identical copy. P53 will tell the cell, hey, look, hold on, stop right there. We've got an error. And P53, along with other proteins, will attempt to correct the error. Sometimes it's successful, the error is fixed, and the cell continues to divide. Sometimes, though, the error, okay, is so great that P53 and other proteins say we can't fix the error, so they will cause that dividing cell to switch directions and go into apoptosis to try to prevent it from becoming producing mutant cells such as cancerous cells. When cancer occurs, such as what we'll talk about at the end of the chapter, what's happened with cancer is usually we have an accumulation of DNA mutations. So something has gone wrong, and sometimes that's during DNA replication. Sometimes there are other factors involved. But the bottom line is proteins such as P53 can't fix the errors. But at the same time, something goes wrong where they're not able to push the cell into apoptosis, and the cell continues to divide from one to two. In the case of cancer, as we'll talk about at the end of the chapter, cancerous cells are mutant cells that are no longer following the rules of cell division. They're just dividing out of control. As long as they have what they need, nutrients, gas, and what have not, they would just start to grow out of control, and then other problems will happen from there. So we'll talk about that at the end. But under normal circumstances, we have another group of proteins that are supposed to check for mistakes, fix those mistakes, or cause that dividing cell to stop dividing and go into apoptosis. Okay, so as I said, we start with somatic parent diploid cells in both males and females. So if you look here, this is a life cycle. I also have this under terms, okay? A life cycle is described as beginning at the stage where a man and a woman are capable of producing gametes. You know gametes better as sex cells or sperm and egg. This is a fancy word for egg, ovum. If you look at the sperm down here, instead of two in, they have in. The ovum or the egg also has in. And they tell you up here, in represents 23. Okay, we'll talk about this more in chapter 13. But for now, life cycle begins here where the male and female are capable of reproduction. They're able to produce gametes or sex cells known as sperm and egg. And if the sperm fertilizes the egg, that fertilized egg will transform into a diploid zygote cell. A zygote is a single cell, but it's diploid. In the case of a human zygote, it's diploid 2N. That means it has two sets of 23 chromosomes. One set of 23 came from dad's sperm. One set of 23 came from mom's egg. This zygote now has all those chromosomes rearranged and paired together inside of the nucleus for a total of 46. If you look down here, every cell that makes up your body, okay, every somatic cell in particular, comes from this zygote. So the majority, the vast majority of your cells are somatic diploid cells that came from this zygote. Okay, and like I said, we'll talk about in chapter 13 how we make a slight exception. But this is where the type of cell division involving mitosis falls. Growth and development right here is what they're showing you. So this is where we are as we continue our discussion about cell division involving mitosis, this part of the life cycle. Okay, so we talked about interphases reach the point of completion. So up here I have interphase G2 phase. When the cell enters G2 of interphase, this is the last subphase of interphase, and the cell is preparing to enter the first of two subphases of the mitotic phase, mitosis. Again, mitosis is division of the nucleus, technically. Okay, So down here, the cell prepares to enter the first of five subphases of mitosis. So in your notes, I give you, mitosis consists of prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now, I combined prophase and prometaphase together, so I don't mind if you just give me four phases on the take-home exam where you just say prophase and you jump straight to uh, pro -meta I mean, jump straight to metaphase, just as long as you explain everything I'm going to talk about that I have in your notes. You usually don't hear about prometaphase during cell division, okay, but they did here, so I kept it in. Okay, so once the cell has prepared itself to enter a type of nuclear division called mitosis during G2 phase of interphase, the cell will transition to prophase. Okay, Prophase is the first subphase of mitosis. What occurs? Well, I'm actually going to go back to interphase. Over here in interphase, they're showing you highlighted in yellow. 
a couple of pairs of what looks like little bitty soda cans to me. These little uh, cylinder-like soda can structures, okay, are non-membranous organelles called centrioles. At this point, write down C chapter 6, non-membranous organelles. We talked about these before, okay? These little non-membranous organelles called centrioles, they exist in two pairs, and they're located in a region in the cytosol called the centrosome. So the centrosome is an area in the cytosol where you will find non-membranous organelles called centrioles, and there are two pairs of them. Now what happens during prophase is the pairs separate from other. One pair of centrioles migrates to one end of the dividing cell. The other pair of centrioles migrates to the opposite end of the dividing cell. And while this is occurring, a structure called the mitotic spindle, these little yellow wire-like structures or finger-like projections begin to form coming off the centrioles. The mitotic spindle, which I'm pointing out up here, the mitotic spindle is made up of proteins called microtubules. So again, the mitotic spindle is formed by proteins called microtubules, and they are these little wire finger off the centrioles. Then what will happen, technically, or, or what will happen also, is the DNA definitely has condensed. Now, I said they say chromosomes, but technically speaking, the DNA has condensed into sister chromatids. And I need to use sister chromatids because we're going to talk about how these sister chromatids are separated into daughter chromosomes. So what will happen is the DNA will condense into sister chromatids. Then technically, during the phase, a structure called the nuclear envelope is disassembled. Come on, little hand. A structure called the nuclear envelope is disassembled. Okay, don't get dizzy, everybody, which is over here. Everybody, again, see chapter six, membranous organelles. The nuclear envelope is the membrane of the nucleus. So again, the nuclear envelope is the membrane of the nucleus. Now what happens if you see here under prophase to prometaphase, the nuclear envelope is gone. It has been disassembled. The compounds that form that membrane will be reused later. Now why would the nuclear envelope need to be disassembled? So that the sister chromatids, which they made smaller here, can begin to attach to the mitotic spindle. Now, if you look here under prometaphase, the sister chromatids have these little black dots in the center of them. The black dots represent the centromeres, which is up here, represent the centromeres as the sister chromatids. Technically speaking, okay, it's the centromeres that connect to the mitotic spindle, okay, and the centromeres are part of the sister chromatids. Now, you can also see down here where it says kinetochore, kinetochore microtubules, yada, yada, yada. Well, that's over here. Listen carefully. At the centromere, which is depicted in black over here on the figure, okay, you will find a high concentration of proteins or a protein complex that they call the kinetochore. Okay. It's this complex of proteins at the centromere, called the kinetochore, that specifically attach to the mitotic spindle here. Okay. It's going to be proteins that are part of the kinetochore, okay, that are going to be the ones responsible for separating our sister chromatids. But again, when the sister chromatids attach to the mitotic spindle, they are attaching at the kinetochore of their centromeres to the mitotic spindle. And that's what they're showing you here. Now, what is actually going to happen, as I show you this one here, if you can see with the little fingers moving up and down, what's actually happening is each individual sister chromatid at their centromeres, as each, of the, each of the chromatids has its own centromere, each of the centromeres are attaching to the mitotic spindle on both sides. What eventually happens is that the sister chromatids align end to end in a single plane. Okay, They call this single plane the metaphase plate. That lets us know we are officially in metaphase. Okay, Now let me go back one here. This right here on this diagram here, if you notice, it says over here, metaphase plate imaginary. This is trying to give you a better visual of what they mean by the sister chromatids aligning end to end in a single plane. Okay, You can barely see it, but they're showing you a glass plate here three-dimensional glass plate that has a square shape to it. And what they're trying to show you is all these sister chromatids that have attached to the mitotic spindle on both sides and have aligned end-to-end, -end, 
have all aligned end to end in a single plane. Okay, that all falls within this glass plate. Okay, the reason for this is that the sister chromatids or the cell itself is trying to arrange all 46 total or 23 pairs of sister chromatids, trying to arrange them in a single plane so that when the sister chromatids are separated into chromosomes, we end up with 23 pairs going this way towards these centrioles and the other 23 pairs going this way. In other words, we're separating the originals from the copies. So once we have the formation of the metaphase plate, we know we're in metaphase, and now the cell is ready to separate the sister chromatids into what we call daughter chromosomes. So each of these sister chromatids here in the metaphase plate, at their centromeres, they're going to be separated from sister chromatids into daughter chromosomes. 23 pairs will be pulled up in this direction. 23 pairs will be pulled down in this direction, although they're not showing you these. Now, how is this possible? Well, it's a combination of the mitotic spindle, okay, and what's in the kinetochore. The kinetochore, okay, is located in the centromere of the sister chromatids in a chromosome. The kinetochore is a protein complex, and one of the key proteins that forms the kinetochore of the centromere is called a motor protein. Motor proteins of the centromere kinetochore physically grab onto the mitotic spindle made up of microtubules, okay, and will pull on the mitotic spindle. What will happen is the, the motor proteins of the centromere kinetochore on one side, okay, will pull one of the two chromatids in the direction of centrioles over here, and then the other motor proteins of the other centromere kinetochore of the other chromatid will pull on the mitotic spindle going this way. This allows for separating our sister chromatids into daughter chromosomes, okay? Now what else happens is as the motor proteins of the centromere kinetochore are pulling the entire daughter chromosome towards opposite ends, the mitotic spindle itself starts to shorten. Let me go back, oops. So what'll happen then is during anaphase is where we actually get the separation of sister chromatids into daughter chromosomes, but it's organized, it's regulated to ensure that an equal number of chromosomes, daughter chromosomes, are moving in opposite directions. That way, when the cell goes into the last phase of a type of nuclear division called mitosis, this last phase of mitosis is called telophase. Now what happens during telophase is notice the mitotic spindle has been disassembled. It's gone. Now you can see the reappearance of two nuclear envelopes forming. Okay, You have the reassembly of one nuclear envelope over here, and now you have a second nuclear envelope being reassembled over here. Each nuclear envelope okay, is going to form around 23 pairs of chromosomes. Therefore, each nuclei that is reforming, it's a diploid nuclei. Now, as this last phase of mitosis telophase, as this last step of nuclear division called telophase is reaching a point of completion, the overall cell begins to divide. So here it says telophase and cytokinesis, but up here I'm trying to tell you, cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. Telophase is the last phase of mitosis, which is nuclear division. So inside the last phase of nuclear division, mitosis is occurring called telophase. Outside is a second part of the mitotic phase called cytokinesis occurring. Cytokinesis is where the cell membrane of our cells, of somatic cells, begins to pinch inward, separating that one somatic parent diploid cell into two identical daughter diploid cells. Each one has its own nucleus that has 23 pairs of chromosomes containing the same identical genetic information, not only between the two identical daughter cells, but also the same identical genetic information to the parent cell that they came from, okay? 
So this is showing you cytokinesis, and it involves a contractile ring in the cell membrane. Okay, mainly what I want you to know is what cytokinesis is. Often they'll use an onion root tip to demonstrate the type of cell division involving mitosis. Okay, all these little rectangular and square shaped structures represents the plant cell that forms that onion root tip. Yeah, everybody's familiar with roots that grow underground. Onions are roots. They grow underground. And as the, the root gets larger and larger, the reason why it's growing larger and larger, well, it has to do with the cells that form that root. The cells are going through rounds of cell division or the cell cycle involving, involving the mitotic phase or mitosis. So as these cells divide from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, overall they cause growth and development of the root. The root grows longer. Okay, some cases the roots are more pointed. But over here it's showing you these cells that form that root tip don't all have to be at the same stage of cell division involving mitosis. Over here they're showing you, hey, these guys are more along the lines of anaphase. This cell over here is in telophase. It's almost, this cell over here is in metaphase. Okay, so they're showing you they're at different stages, but they're all going through a type of cell division involving mitosis or the mitotic phase. Okay, and as the number of cells increases, so does the size of the growth and development of the root. So again, the type of cell division we're talking about in Chapter 12, it involves interphase, just like the type we'll talk about in Chapter 13. But the second major phase of this type of cell division or cell cycle is the mitotic phase, and the star of the show is mitosis, which they show you here. But mitosis is where one nucleus divides into two nuclei, okay? Cytokinesis is division of the whole cell. Well, as I said before, okay, cell division is tightly regulated. It's regulated both through proteins that are responsible for making sure the cell goes through these different phases, okay, associated with cell division. So that we end up from one parent diploid cell dividing into two identical daughter diploid cells that are all somatic and they all function normally. And we talked about there are proteins such as P53, their job is to check for mistakes, check for errors, try to correct those errors. And if they can't, don't let this cell continue to divide, cause the cell to shift directions and go into apoptosis. But nothing's perfect. And what happens is mutations can accumulate specifically during S phase of interphase or just exposure to harmful carcinogens in the environment. And what happens then is as these mutations at the level of DNA accumulate, this is what leads to what we call cancer. Listen carefully. At the heart of cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. But what they mean by uncontrolled cell growth is what I put here, uncontrolled cell division. What can happen, okay, and there are different reasons that can cause it. Something could happen to P53 itself to where it's no longer around to check for mistakes. Something could happen to one of the cyclin CDKs to where they're made, they're mutated, and they're made in a manner where they just don't listen to anything else. They want the cell to divide. Okay, there are different reasons, but the bottom line at the heart of cancer is uncontrolled, uncontrolled cell growth. Now, I'm not saying that's the entire explanation for cancer, but this is at the heart of it. Okay, now, when cells, okay, mutate, becoming cancerous, first and foremost, they undergo uncontrolled division. Now, often what will happen is that these newly divide, or these dividing cells, that when one cell divides into two and two divides into four, what ends up happening is these cells will often stay attached to each other at their membranes, forming a mass of cells called a tumor. So tumors are large groups of abnormally dividing cells or cancerous cells. Now, in my days, whenever these cells grew out of control, okay, went through, uh, started exhibiting uncontrolled cell division and formed a tumor, we automatically said it was cancer. Now, sometimes today they'll say, no, it's not. It's got to be malignant. Hey, everybody, I don't know of a, of a good story about a tumor being good. Okay, the way I describe them is there's one that's a lesser evil than the other. So what researchers found out, okay, is that when these tumors are formed, by these abnormally dividing cells that are growing, dividing uncontrollably, they can form two different masses of cells. They can form tumors that are called benign tumors or tumors that are called malignant tumors. Okay, Benign tumors are the lesser of two evils but still cause a lot of problems. 
Okay, A benign tumor is what I describe as being made up of cancerous cells, cells that are growing uncontrollably. Except these cells, okay, as they divide from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, they stay attached to each other. However, that mass of cells, okay, those cancerous cells are all dividing, so that tumor grows larger and larger. Now, the cells that make up that benign tumor, they're described as non-invasive. In other words, they don't grow into neighboring tissues. In other words, the tumor does, tumor's not a nice, perfect round ball. In other words, it can be abnormal in its shape to where it develops finger-like projections that go into neighboring tissues. For a benign tumor, they should not do that. So we say it's non-invasive. Also, the cancerous cells that make up that benign tumor, they are not what we call metastatic. They do not spread to other regions of the body forming new tumors. However, I've known at least two people that have had benign brain tumors. And in that case, they had a, they had a, a how do you say, severe neurological problems because that benign brain tumor was still growing larger and larger, pressing up against neighboring brain tissue. So they would suffer from severe headaches. I remember one, one was a friend of my son. He was, uh, they were in kindergarten at the time, and the doctor said he had a migraine. And it wasn't a migraine. It was a benign tumor in the posterior of his brain. Also, he was suffering from blurred vision and nausea. So as I said, I know some doctors and maybe oncologists. Have you ever heard of a cancer doctor? A cancer doctor is called an oncologist. Onco, O-N-C-O is a biological prefix or biological term or prefix that means cancer. Okay, I, I don't see it that way. It's a problem. A problem's a problem. However, the fact it's non-invasive and not metastatic okay, makes it the lesser of two evils. So over here, they're showing you sometimes what can happen. Right, there you go. So Francisco, if y'all see on the chat room, he knows firsthand. Yeah, I, I don't consider either type good. So forgive me, Francisco, for what I'm going to say here. I don't want to add distress. They're showing you here, okay, what amounts to colon cancer. How sometimes a tumor is identified in the colon. Everybody, the lay term for colon is large intestines, okay, just to let you know. If you ever hear somebody use the term colon, they're talking about your large intestines. So what you see here is they're showing you, hey, we get a mass of cells being formed by cells that are growing uncontrollably, dividing uncontrollably, but the mass of cells is staying right here. It's not growing into the walls of the colon or large intestines. So initially, it looks like a benign tumor. However, they're showing you sometimes a benign tumor can switch to a malignant tumor or the tumor that forms automatically is a malignant tumor. In this case, they show you it's still made up of a mass of cells, but now notice the tumor, the cells that form the tumor, these cancerous cells are, divide, are starting to extend out into the wall of the colon. So going back to the previous slide, whenever the cancerous cells that form the tumor cause the tumor to grow in a manner that it spreads into neighboring tissues, we now say that the tumor is invasive and therefore it is a malignant tumor. A malignant tumor, the best way I can describe it, is a malignant tumor is made up of, okay, aggressive cancer cells, malignant cancer cells. These cells aren't just interested in forming a larger and larger mass, okay, called a tumor. They start to, that mass starts to extend out and invade neighboring tissues. Thus, we say it's invasive. And then what's even a lot scarier, and I had this happen to a student that, okay, that had a brain tumor, is that these cancerous cells are aggressive to the point that they're metastatic. Metastatic cancer cells, sometimes they'll say metastasis, but, or metastasis, but metastatic cancer cells spread to other regions of the body, forming new tumors far from the site of origin. So I'm using this, breast cancer, okay? Here they show you the breast cancer. Here we have some abnormally dividing cells that form a tumor. One thing an oncologist will wanna do is take a tissue biopsy, remove some of these cells to try to determine if they can figure out, are these cancerous cells forming a benign tumor or are these cancerous cells that are forming a malignant tumor? Sometimes the cancer is not diagnosed to where, until they realize, yeah, just based on shape, I can see this tumor is invading neighboring tissues. It's a malignant tumor. Okay, now we need to look and see, okay, 
if metastasis or metastasis has occurred. In other words, now we need to look and see if some of these aggressive cancer cells have detached from the mass of cells forming the malignant tumor, have detached and either entered your circulatory system, entered your blood vessels, or entered a fluid called lymph running through your lymph vessels. Everybody, you take an A&P class, they will talk about the circulatory system, okay, as part of the cardiovascular system, blood flowing through your blood vessels. But there's another organ system called the lymphatic system. It's made up partly of lymphatic vessels, which you find radiating throughout your body. And these lymphatic vessels have their own solution going through them called lymph. And what they found is that in the case of malignant tumors, not only are they invasive growing into neighboring tissues while still maintaining that mass of attached cells, but some of these cancerous malignant cells will detach from the mass into your bloodstream or your lymph and spread to another location of the body. Down here, what I've put are structures called lymph nodes, which are connected to lymph vessels. So one thing an oncologist will do is once they've identified it as a malignant tumor, they will check structures called lymph nodes in the armpit area and chest area. Because they found that in the case of breast cancer, if it's a malignant tumor, okay, and it's metastatic, that these cancerous cells not only enter your bloodstream through your blood vessels, but they will enter your lymph vessels and as they're flowing through their lymph vessels, they will reach structures called lymph nodes located in these areas, which is shown here on the diagram. And that's another place an oncologist will look to see, to definitely verify if the, can the malignant tumor is not only invasive, but if it's static. Okay. But at the heart of this, as I said, is something has gone wrong with a dividing cell going through this type of cell division. So... But the catch with cancer is it can either be due to spontaneous mutations in somatic diploid cells of your body, which means they won't, that those mutations won't be passed on to your offspring. However, okay, some forms of cancer, such as one called Lee or Meany syndrome, are inherited forms of cancer. You inherited genetic information from your mom and dad in the form of DNA, and it's found now in every cell of your body that came from that zygote. Okay, so now it's just a ticking time bomb where cancer can develop at any time. So in that case, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about it more in chapter 13, 14, and 15. In that case, we'll talk about, okay, the mutation now is not found just in somatic cells. It's found in gametes, sex cells called sperm and egg. But that's another thing an oncologist wants to do. Hey, is the cancer due to a genetic disorder or is the cancer due to something that specifically happened in only your body? And if you have children, you don't, you should be okay. So I know it's not on a happy note, but if you're going to med school, this definitely chapter 12 and, and tumors you want to know about. And then chapter 13 as we go on. Okay, listen carefully, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to stop the recording here, but hold on. Don't leave the session yet. <clears throat> 